OK, um, at first, I, I just want to tell you, for those of you who don't know me and haven't seen me, that's me. That's what I do. Um, this is not meant to be an all in depth discussion on STDs or STIs, but to hit some of the more common things that uh, you may encounter early on. We'll go back later on and go through some of the other ones like bacterial vaginosis, et cetera, uh, um, trichomonas, et cetera, in more depth in a little bit later date. Um, so why do we even worry about this? Why diagnose and treat STDs uh, or STIs? What's the difference between an STD and an STI? An sexually transmitted infection is not um, symptomatic. So you have infection, but not disease. But once you develop symptoms, then that that's the disease part of it. So uh, the, these names get used interchangeably. Uh, so if I'm saying STD or STI, we're, we're talking about the same thing. Uh, from data many, many years ago now that there are at least 19 million STDs in the U.S., that's an underestimate. We don't know the the full extent of it because many of these are not reportable infections, but it's at least that, if not more. Uh, it has impacts in women's reproductive health with chlamydia and gonorrhea because of the uh, association with pelvic inflammatory disease and scarring of fallopian tubes, et cetera. Uh, it is a huge, uh, especially chlamydia, is a big uh, cause of infection that leads to infertility in the United States and also infant mortality and morbidity with neonatal HIV, which we've come a long way with that, uh, as well as herpes simplex. Uh, and also, you know, because of um, a lot of these sexually transmitted infections are either ulcerative or inflammatory, they set the stage for people who don't have HIV. They come in contact and they have an ulcerative or inflammatory STD that increases the chance that they can acquire HIV. And it, it costs a lot of money. Uh, I mean, again, these are old numbers, but at least 15 billion is probably closer to 19 at this point. Uh, so where are we? Well, COVID kind of put the squash on getting a lot of updated information. This is the last that came out in 2018 of the rates of chlamydia gonorrhea, syphilis with congenital and primary and secondary. And we can see um, compared to 2017, we had almost a 3% increase in chlamydia in one year, uh, a 5% increase in gonorrhea in a year, uh, a 13.3% increase in syphilis overall with almost a 40% increase in congenital syphilis. Now, the numbers are not huge, but when you're looking at this increasing 40% on something that's really preventable by screening and managing during pregnancy, I, I think this this is a big lesson and it's it's um, a huge lesson lost because it didn't occur. Um, and we're seeing a lot of um, new infections with primary and secondary syphilis that increased almost 14 and a half percent in a year. Um, so this is just looking at where, you know, uh, from 2018, and this doesn't change a huge amount, unfortunately, but some of the, the heat areas, although they're in blue, um, of where that we're seeing primary and secondary syphilis. Historically, it's been in the south, especially in the southeast and in parts of the west and uh, up into the west coast. Um, it is interesting that um, Alaska does get spared a lot of this, and on the next slide you'll see it, it doesn't necessarily with a couple of other ones. Uh, and by the way, to remind you, I think you can see the pointer, you live here. You live in a county that's got a pretty significant rate of syphilis. Um, the same kind of things with gonorrhea and chlamydia, you see the, the same kind of distributions looking into the south. And it is interesting that when you look in Alaska, uh, either chlamydia or gonorrhea, and people always kid and say, well, there's six months of light and six months of darkness must be the darkness part of it. There's some significant social networking that goes on um, with face-to-face -face social encountering, even when people are, are you know, um, riding snowmobiles to get into bars and things. And they've actually identified in some of these, some people who have been termed super spreaders because they're very popular in some of the social networks and don't get diagnosed until later. Um, so why bother even screening for this? Because we do uh, screening for sexually transmitted infections, and um, this is just a conglomerate of a multiple uh, quadrant uh, of um, 
presentations looking at with men in the cyan and women more in the orange um, this is the amount of people who are asymptomatic who you can detect as you see with gonorrhea in the urethral rectal or pharyngeal area in men even though we talk about um, with gonorrhea being very symptomatic in men uh, 10 to in some papers 15 percent of individuals can be totally asymptomatic, and yet you can um, detect it either by PCR or growing gonorrhea from a male urethra, but they can give it to others who can become symptomatic. Um, if you look at the rectal area, you see the numbers are higher with gonorrhea, and in the pharyngeal area, most of what you're seeing is actually asymptomatic. Um, so that's when, when we talk about screening, which we will in just a moment, about screening for gonorrhea um, in other places besides just the genital area. Same thing that you see here with chlamydia, especially in women, cervical chlamydia, unless something happens like pelvic inflammatory disease, then it tends to be more of an asymptomatic infection. And um, men in the rectal urethral area, we do see chlamydia and the same thing with women. And actually, genital herpes, um, the primary way of this being spread is when people are asymptomatic. We know that from a couple of failed uh, HPV or HPV, HSV vaccine trials, where probably 60 to 70% of herpes is transmitted by people who are asymptomatic to susceptible individuals. Um, so when you talk about screening in women, usually they get annual screening or every two years, uh, depending on how often they're getting pap smears and uh, evaluations. Generally, this is looked at uh, for age 25 or less and with older women with a risk factor. Now, what's a risk factor? The easiest way for me to tell you that is new partner, no condom. That's a risk factor. What's even worse? New partners, no condoms. So the more uh, of different individuals who might have an infection, the higher the chance of them acquiring something. So anyone who has a new partner, and if I'm getting a sexual history, which would take us probably half an hour to 45 minutes to run through that, I always ask, tell me about your sexual partners, plural. Um, they may be happy to tell you about one partner, but they won't tell you about the other one to two to three to 10 or however many that they may be um, having sex with. Uh, with heterosexual men, um, really screening more for chlamydia, uh, especially in high prevalence areas like adolescent uh, clinics and correction facilities, STD clinics, et cetera. Uh, gonorrhea is not usually recommended, but it really, to be honest, doesn't matter because of the nucleic acid amplified tests that we're using. Um, they test for both chlamydia and gonorrhea. So uh, even though you might not be all that interested in it, you're going to get that result if you're using many of these NAT tests. Uh, in men who are sexually active with other men, um, they should be annually screened like we do in our clinics. And uh, if the risk is higher, if they have multiple partners, you may need to screen more frequently. Um, this just gives you an idea, and this is adapted from uh, the recommendations out in California. And uh, what it's looking at is for women, and you see age less than 25, age greater than 25, um, and then some additional screening things on the side of maybe screening for syphilis, trick, um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, if an increased risk for that. Uh, over the age of that, at least one time screening for HIV, unless there's other risk factors. Uh, during pregnancy, there are a lot more things, and many of these are driven by state laws that during pregnancy in the first uh, and in many states, even third trimester, that you screen for chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, uh, and HIV. In some states, it's HBV. Uh, so those are things that, you know, you need to be aware of depending on where you're practicing and what clinic situation you might be in. Uh, in our HIV infected individuals, definitely the same kind of things, uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomonas in women, syphilis um, annually, and hep B and hep C at the first visit, unless that there are risk factors that might predispose to infection with either hep B or hep C. Uh, men, the list is a little longer. Um, HIV uninfected okay. men having sex with women at least and once with HIV, and then if there's risk factors. HIV and Hep C, and then they'll check you as well. Well, he's going to be gone. 
somebody's doesn't matter. Do they have any labs from him? Yeah, probably from the past. OK, great. Um, so you see the additional screening comments, obviously, if they're at increased risk. Uh, with MSMs, you see a long list like we talked about before, many of these at least annually, um, but more if there's higher risks, as you see, maybe every three months. And um, with our HIV infected individuals, the same types of things. And I'm happy to share this with you later if you'd like a copy. Um, so we've talked about a lot of this. And the other thing that sometimes is an issue is doing rectal gonorrhea, uh, chlamydia, NAT testing because uh, most of the oral and rectal NATs are not FDA approved, but they are done in commercial facilities because they've been validated and the CDC and others have um, published years ago how to validate these tests. So they can be done. Um, chlamydia in the oropharyngeal area is pretty uncommon. It's not impossible, but we do get really worried about gonorrhea in the oropharyngeal area because of the association in some studies outside the US with uh, cetriaxone resistant gonorrhea being acquired. Um, this is also a great time to talk about PrEP, uh, trying to decrease HIV acquisition in people who are HIV non-infected at that point. So um, not to leave that out, I, it's obviously a very important point and uh, it needs to be discussed if, you know, at least once, but definitely offer it again to people uh, because we, we can do this very effectively, especially through the VA. And I just want to show you some data. This is 2018 data through CDC and their STD surveillance network or the S-SUN um, network. And this is 2018. This is looking at urogenital gonorrhea and chlamydia in uh, MSM STD clinics. And what you're seeing in the lighter green and, and the brown bars here are uh, the number of people tested and the bottom bars are the number of people that were uh, determined to be positive. And you're seeing a lot of screening um, and some people being positive. Now, again, this is urogenital screening and it's men. Now, when you compare that to rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia screening, you don't see as much screening because in some places it's a little bit more difficult, but look at the positivity rates significantly more than what you saw with just genital screening. And that's why it's important to really screen definitely rectally for gonorrhea and chlamydia in addition to genital. Um, just to mention to you, the treatment of chlamydia um, can either be azithromycin or doxycycline for years in the 2015 STD, uh, CDC STD treatment guidelines had said uh, a gram of azithromycin because it's a one-time dose and you're done. There's some issues now with azithromycin and We'll get to that when we talk about uh, treatment for chlamydia. I'm sorry, for gonorrhea. But um, there is a doxycycline delayed release. It's a 200 milligram tablet. I do not know the cost on this. I personally have not used it, but you could give 200 milligrams once a day instead of 100 twice a day. Um, and in the last iterations of the guidelines, uh, amoxicillin had been um, a recommended dose during pregnancy, but has been moved to an alternative regimen in pregnancy because it's just not as effective as using azithromycin. Um, we generally don't use doxycycline during pregnancy. Actually, doxy is okay um, in young children as long as you're not going to use it for a prolonged period of time because it, it doesn't have the issues with enamel staining or bone growth. Um, some of the other emerging issues I do want to mention to you that uh, non-gonococcal urethritis means just that. It's not gonorrhea. It's something else. It could be urea plasmas. It could be trichomonas. It could be even herpes simplex. Um, but it's one of the ones that's emerging is a different mycoplasma, ure urea plasma organism. And this one's mycoplasma genitalia. It is a definitely recognized cause of urethritis. It might be uh, associated. There's more data suggesting that it's associated with pelvic inflammatory disease as well. Um, there is now finally a diagnostic test that the FDA cleared. It is uh, the brand name on its aptima. It is a mycoplasma genitalium assay. You can find that um, and order it, but uh, in the VA it would have to be a send out, so you'd have to discuss that with pathology. 
but um, outside that, uh, if you're looking at an STD clinic, I don't know what the cost is. So uh, it, this may or may not be something you could use in an STD clinic with people with limited to no funding. Um, when to suspect it if they have a persistent or recurrent urethritis, especially if they got treated with doxycycline, where doxy's not quite so hot and treating mycoplasma genitalia. Azithra is much better. It's over 80% plus, but there is emerging resistance to azithromycin. So let's say you treat somebody and um, the GC and chlamydia NAT test is negative and you treated them with azithromycin and they just don't have uh, much of a response and uh, still with this persistent symptomatology of urethritis, what could be considerations? Well, one would be M genitalium. Um, and if you thought it was an azithromycin failure, one of the things that you can use is moxifloxacin, 400 milligram tablet for seven days. Although there is some data suggesting that there is some resistance occurring with moxifloxacin. Um, also in men, one of the things that's a little bit, had been difficult to do or, or to, to diagnose was trichomonas vaginalis which also can cause some inflammatory reactions. Uh, in the past, we were trying to do a wet prep and stick a you know, urethral swab in men, and men obviously love that. Um, but now there is a urine-based um, analyte assay that you can order for that, it's a, a T-vaginalis NAT test. Again, uh, it, it is somewhat pricey, so it may be limited depending on the person's funding. Um, but if you don't have that, then what you could do if you're in a situation where you can't test for uh, MG because of funding and you can't test for T vaginalis because of uh, funding for NAT, you could treat for both. Uh, you could try you know, putting them on moxifloxacin, hope they can you know, afford that, um, and to give them two grams of metronidazole um, with the caution about alcohol, that's become somewhat debatable as to whether that's a real problem or not. If the symptoms persist, uh, generally what's recommended is that maybe there's something else going on, urethral stricture or some, you know, post-infectious inflammatory reaction, and, and they may benefit by seeing urology for evaluation. Uh, just some pictures of gonorrhea, some that we had taken during our uh, over 20-year tenure doing STD teaching um, in the Southeast and even in uh, parts of the Midwest. Um, this guy we saw, I forget where it was, I think it was in North Carolina at um, one of our courses, who has a genital wart as well as gonorrhea. That's a bad day. Um, so you can see even with this one, this was actually taken here many years ago from a patient who showed up in the emergency department. And just look at the inflammation, that periurethral inflammation and kind of the characteristic, if you will, drip, because that was one of the other street names for this disease. Um, treatment has has changed recently. In 2015, the um, CDC recommended using 250 milligrams of ceftriaxone as a single IM injection, plus concurrently giving them azithromycin, uh, a dose of one gram orally once. And there were, you know, an alternative was be uh, suffixing 400 plus AZ at a gram if you couldn't get ceftriaxone. That was to try and delay or prevent resistance developing to ceftriaxone because resistance with gonorrhea has occurred to lots of different beta lactams. But what happened in December of this year was really interesting because when people were doing actually antimicrobial stewardship and looking through the gonococcal isolate surveillance project that the CDC runs and several different centers around the United States looking at susceptibility to lots of these um, bacteria and um, their antibiotic susceptibility patterns. What they saw was, um, if you're looking at these dark blue bars, and this was gonorrhea susceptibility, I'm sorry, ceftriaxone responsibility and the lighter shades, suffixime in these little darker bars, you didn't see much of anything happening with ceftriaxone, but what do you see starting in 2014? Really more resistance to azithromycin. So because of this, things have changed. Now what's recommended is, uh, and also we were looking at weight-based dosing of ceftriaxone and in some people were probably giving too little. 
if uh, their uh, BMI was more significant. So the newer recommendations are to stop using azithromycin unless you absolutely have to, and to give 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone as a single dose, or if the person's above 300 pounds or 150 kilos, to give them a one gram IM dose. I highly recommend you don't admix that in sterile water or you will have an enemy for the rest of your life because it's really painful to do that. Um, it's best if you can put it, uh, admix it in lidocaine, it, it helps because it's a, it's a higher dose, uh, a little bit more volume to give. And if you're not sure if they have chlamydia or not, maybe, let's say the test hasn't come back and you want to cover for chlamydia, now the preferred treatment is doxycycline at the dose we talked about before, 100 milligram twice a day for seven days. Uh, let's say that they have um, an anaphylactic reaction to ceftriaxone. Well, you could use gentamicin at a dose of 240 milligrams and a single dose of azithromycin at two grams, which is not too tolerable in, in itself. Um, this data actually has not shown to be all that uh, efficacious, especially the gentamicin. It was used in parts of Africa is where the gent dose came from, but the follow-up hasn't been as stellar as people thought. They were also saying that you could use gemifloxacin, but we haven't had gemifloxacin in the United States since 2015. Um, the other CDC recommendation was to use a higher dose of suffixime um, as the agent for um, gonorrhea. And then what if it's in the pharynx? Because suffixing doesn't get into the pharynx very well. So if you can't use ceftriaxone, they recommend basically talking to us or if they have a Steven Johnson's reaction or something else. I'm just gonna tell you that I would give serious thought to probably having to give them IV ertapenem. It lasts 24 hours. You may need more than one dose. There's not great data out there. Um, and those are gonna be case by case decisions. Um, now we're looking at ulcerative diseases, uh, gone from inflammatory to ulcerative disease to um, syphilis, looking at primary syphilis. And what you notice are these ulcers, but they're clean based. And for the vast majority of these, they're, they're relatively or fully painless. People don't even necessarily know they have them. And I would think that this lady, this is from a slide set from a long time ago. This is a cervix with a chancre on it, and I'm pretty sure that um, this lady and probably uh, her male partner don't really know that that's there unless that they have a speculum and can actually take a look. So some people have these. These are classic looking shankers and sometimes they don't exactly look that way. Other manifestations, so you know as you go along you can have secondary syphilis um, and there can be overlap between the healing of a shanker and some of these manifestations, this is the rash that you can see, and the rash can actually look different. Uh, it looks different depending on the underlying skin pigmentation of the person. Um, the palmar plantar rash that you can see, this guy had actually been treated a week prior, so his rash is starting to go away. We saw him in the Atlanta Fulton County Clinic across from Grady. Um, but this occurs 60 to maybe 70% of the time, so it's not always there but more commonly can be. Um, this is what you can see. Uh, this is not acne. This is actually secondary syphilis on a face. And sometimes they have kind of almost like a coin lesion appearance, but this looks more look, kind of like acne. Um, this was a picture that um, my colleagues had taken when we were doing a course in Miami at the STD clinic there uh, several years ago. And what you're seeing are these areas that do look warty, but they're flat. So this is condyloma. This is not acuminata because that's HPV. This is condyloma lata. Remember that latum is Latin for flat. So these are the flat warts of secondary syphilis. One of the other things that you might see, and people say, well, you know, if you're doing an uh, STD physical exam, you don't have to look in the mouth. I would I would caution against doing that because here you're seeing these white patches. These are mucus patches, and there's lots of different pictures showing you mucus patches in the mouth, which certainly can be syphilis, but could be other things as well. Could be lichen planus, could be you know a lot of different things. Um, I do want to mention to you about looking at syphilis serology traditionally. This is what was done, and this is still what is um, done in many STD clinics around the nation. 
um, that you order an RPR or you do it in the clinic. And if it comes back positive, generally, uh, hopefully you're going to titer it out. So you know what the higher titer is, because after treatment, you can follow that titer to give you a, a crude gauge on how your treatment was. But if it's negative, you stop, they're done. Um, if you get an RPR, it's recommended you do a confirmatory test because sometimes these RPRs can be falsely positive. So the one that's recommended by the CDC now is a treponema pallidum particle agglutination or TPPA test. So if you have somebody who's got a positive RPR and a TPPA is positive, uh, with very, very few exceptions, that person has syphilis. Um, but what if you have a positive RPR and it's negative? Then that's when you start getting into some of these confounders where that you can have a positive RPR uh, and it's due to something else. And we won't go into the list of that, but just remember that there are several things to think about with this uh, causing false positive RPRs. Um, what we've done at the VA and um, commercially, this is what they're doing because we don't have enough techs to do this, uh, to, to do an RPR manually, uh, takes on a good day 10 minutes uh, and routinely 15 minutes. You can just imagine, um, you know, um, one blood or something going out, collecting 600 units of blood, a really good day to get blood. It's got to be all processed into the different products, and it has to be screened for a multitude of potential infections, including syphilis. Can you imagine how long it would take you if it took 15 minutes to do one RPR? It would take you a, a lot of individuals, a lot of techs doing that. So because we don't have that many techs being available to do this anymore in, in a larger volume situation, um, what places are doing is called a reverse sequence testing where you're using an FDA approved um, either uh, enzyme immunoassay or chemiluminescent uh, assay, depending on which uh, platform that you're using. So an EIA just goes into a card reader. You set up the wells and doing this um, and it, you can batch multiple ones of these. You put it in the card reader. Maybe it takes you an hour to set them up. You walk away and when you come back, you're gonna find that some of these are positive. Those are the ones then you do the RPRs on. Uh, you could either send them out or do them in-house. So if you, let's say you had a hundred of these and you had five that were positive, well, it's a whole lot easier to work up five than it is to work up a hundred. So now you're doing an RPR and the same thing, if it's positive, that's probably pretty suggestive that you have syphilis. Um, but the guidelines that said if you're going to do this, it's probably not unwise to get a second confirmatory test. So that's what we do here. Then you will get a TPPA and you will have an RPR with a titer. Um, so this basically tells you that, yeah, if it's positive, syphilis has been there in the past or present. And if it's negative, it's probably unlikely. The conundrum with this test is, is very interesting between these two. And we see this from time to time. The EIA is positive. The RPR is negative, but we, we actually do both tests at the same time. And it'll come back, the TPPA is either negative or positive. Well, if the TPPA is negative, and this is positive, this is a false positive EIA, because nothing else is positive. But occasionally, the EIA will be positive, the RPR will be negative, and the TPPA will be positive. Well, that suggests they've had an exposure to syphilis, and that's when that you would have to talk to that individual to see if they've ever been treated or ever had a diagnosis of syphilis uh, and ever received treatment for that. Problem is, a lot of people don't recall that, or they may still not want to admit that that happened. So this was a conundrum because here, if the RPR is non-reactive, you're done. You don't get this test. So it, it kind of, in a way, sets up a dichotomy between these two. Um, and what the CDC wrestled with with this, so they they made this as the recommendation. Um, some of us didn't agree. Some of us, you know, said, well, whatever. Is that they offered the patient treatment, um, essentially for late latent syphilis, because we don't know uh, since they don't recall an end of this test wasn't positive within a year's duration to make it an early latent. It would be a late latent disease. We'll mention it in a second. So you treat them with a total of 7.2 million doses of benzathine penicillin once a week for three weeks. Now they can say they've been treated for syphilis. So if they ever get tested again, then they don't have to get 
tested. Um, my concern is that you're treating a test result and not necessarily a patient, but it is confusing, uh, and that's where we are with it. Uh, I would refer you to this New England Journal of Medicine back in 2020. I do have it um, on my VA computer, the PDF. I'm happy to send it to you, but it it talks about how to you know interpret these tests whether that it's on a traditional or reverse sequence algorithm. So you're seeing three discussions here and three discussions here, and a lot of that I won't go into, but you can see the interpretation sometimes isn't quite as clear cut as we thought. So um, just let me know, I can send this to all of you, and it's got this also great um, flow chart, if you will, of what can happen with syphilis. This is not linear. You can have people get primary infection and become latent for a long period of time, sometimes for up to months, and then go on to develop secondary syphilis about 20, almost 25% of the time. Um, some of these people don't even have, they'll have primary infection and can go on to be late, latent, which is a little uncommon. Um, and 40% of the time you get CNS invasion, so why don't we see a lot of symptomatic neurosyphilis? Most people have an intact in, uh, an immune system in their brain and can mount a pretty good response and they don't develop neurosyphilis, but some do uh, and some are asymptomatic. So this is a great paper. I, I highly recommend you look through this. I think it's going to answer uh, a lot of questions and anything you don't understand, please let me know. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, I do want to just off this slide to touch on a couple of things. We used to talk about doing a dark field exam where you'd squeeze on a lesion and get a little bit of serous fluid, put that on a glass slide, put a cover slip on it, and look at it under a dark field microscope uh, where the, the condenser doesn't have a light directly going through it, but bounces off the sides of mirrors to look at it. So you're illuminating these little threads of treponema pallidum so that you can see them. It's not taught by hardly anybody at all, and facilities doing this have become really, really uncommon. It's becoming a lost art to do that. So if you have somebody who's got a lesion that looks like syphilis, you can do a PCR on that. Uh, it, PCRs have not, to my knowledge, been validated on blood at this point, so we, we can't necessarily do that. And PCRs in spinal fluid uh, are not reliable at this point. Uh, so PCRs essentially from an ulcer would be the way to go. Um, the other thing I highly want to recommend is if Sometimes what people have is they had an RPR done and then they get referred to you and you're seeing them, the RPR was done two weeks ago and they want you to treat them. You're treating on an RPR done two weeks ago. That test may be much, that titer may be much higher by now. So if you treat, let's say the, the titer was a one to 32. Well, two weeks later, it may be a one to 128 or one to 256 and you treat them and you follow them up uh, at six months, and it didn't decrease, but maybe one dilution, uh, what it looks like from your initial one. But when in fact it, it decreased more than fourfold, it went down about five dilutions, which would be great. So this can be a real confusing issue. Uh, try and get an RPR. If it's done in like a week or so, you know, less than a week would be optimal. Um, people who have uh, primary and secondary syphilis, the earlier stages, are more likely to decrease this fourfold or two dilution decrease after treatment. If the titer's lower or sometimes with HIV, um, it may be not quite as, uh, you may not see it decline quite as rapidly as you do with uh, people with more recent infections. Um, just to mention to you, standard treatment for primary, secondary, early latent syphilis is 2.4 million units. I am. Uh, once a week. Giving more penicillin doesn't make any difference. There's the reference for that. And um, giving for primary, secondary, early uh, one dose or late latent syphilis doesn't do anything better either. So just one dose of 2.4 million units of benzathine penicillin works great whether they have HIV or not. Um, I'm sorry, alternatives, if they just cannot for whatever the reason, um, use penicillin, doxycycline for um, primary, secondary, early latent syphilis. The dose is 100 milligram twice a day for two weeks. Uh, alternatively, ceftriaxone could be used, but do not use azithromycin um, because the dose that had been looked at was two grams 
there is this is the more common mutant. There are some others. There's an A2056G mutation that causes failure. Um, so it's not recommended in MSMs or pregnant women, and we really don't have an idea the, uh, what the extent of this resistant is across the United States. Um, late latent syphilis is if somebody had an, um, an RPR done two years ago and it was negative, and now you're getting it and it's one to 16. When did they get infected? We don't know. And they don't have lesions on an exam, so it's greater than a year or unknown duration, and they get treated for late latent syphilis. Um, so that's the 7.2 million units of benzathine penicillin. It's given once a week for three consecutive weeks. That can be problematic in some people because they don't show up sometimes. Um, just remember that T. pallidum, the doubling time is uh, on average 30 to 33 hours. Uh, some uh, references say it could be up to 42 hours, but generally it's going to take you about a day and a half for T. pallidum to replicate, as opposed to Neisseria gonorrhea, that's 20 to 30 minutes. That's why you need a long-acting um, penicillin. And this is, benzathine is a really oily um, compound, as you know, if you've ever pushed it in someone's derriere. Um, if you have somebody that's done pregnant, you can only miss one dose. They have to get, let's say they got the first dose, came back next week, got the second dose, missed the dose, go ahead and give them a third dose and then just follow them along. During pregnancy, any missed dose requires a restart. Uh, no questions asked. The data is just there and suggests that it's suboptimal treatment, and we don't want our rates of congenital syphilis being higher. If they miss two doses, we've had some people don't like getting jabbed every week. They come in, they get a, would get a shot, miss a week, come back for a second shot, say, got to come back for next week. They don't. They show up and say, I need my third shot. And you say, now nah, you get to start all over. Uh, that doesn't go over too well either. Um, in finishing up, I just want to um, show you a few slides. This is kind of what we've been taught in school um, as the occurrence of herpes. This may be an immune compromised individual to some degree. Um, you're seeing a lot of these shallow serpiginous looking ulcers. The same thing here. And this lady who has a pretty significant outbreak. Um, gee, does that look like herpes? Is that that's really genital herpes? It is. And because that the site of infection wasn't necessarily external, but was up inside in um, the cervical area. That infection can actually lay dormant in sacral ganglia. So when it expresses itself, it can come out um, in the posterior area and sometimes can be misidentified as herpes zoster. Um, the good news with that is even if it is, the treatment for zoster will certainly treat uh, for herpes simplex. And here we see the crusted areas, and you can see the reference where I got this from. Um, this is telling you that it's it's on its way to healing, and um, you may see that. But what's probably even a more common manifestation that's been recognized over the last almost decade are these linear ulcerations, it's apparently, you know, in areas where there's intertriginous fissures. So um, between, the, you know, the, um, the thigh and uh, either the labia or sometimes around the scrotal sac area. Um, they've been called a knife cut lesion in the publications. We had a patient downtown who told us that he had a haircut. And um, we said, why are you here today? I have a haircut. And we looked at him and said, it is a nice quaff, but why are you here? And he actually educated us that, no, I got this sore. And this is not that person, but it looked kind of like it, this linear um, ulceration which uh, you should think it could be herpes, may not be, but that's one of the things to think about. Um, again, recall that most people with HSV, and we're seeing more HSV in the genital area than we used to, we're seeing actually a little bit more HSV too in the oropharyngeal area than we used to because of sexual practices, um, that asymptomatic viral shedding accounts for about 70% of the new genital herpes infections. Testing, um, generally, uh, don't get an IgM. If you get an IgM and ask me to interpret it for you, I'm going to ask you why you got to test in the first place. Uh, they they cross-react with lots of different things. They are not useful, even with congenital herpes, um, so don't get them. It's a waste of money. Uh, if they have lesions, the best thing is to get an HSV PCR on lesions. Um, if you are looking to see if people have been exposed to herpes, 
What we talk about is getting type specific herpes serologic tests. This is looking for glycoprotein G on the outside capsid. Um, ones that have been really, um, I won't say pushed, but you know, selected more than others had been the herpes select HSV2 ELISA test and the HSV1 ELISA test. But there's some problems with this as we've learned over the years that the ELISA may be false positive at low reported ind uh, index values being somewhere around 1.2 to 3.5. So if you're getting a herpes select and it's in this lower range, you probably should confirm it with a different assay like a bio kit. Um, I mentioned to you the Western blot. Um, this is a send out, definitely goes to the University of Washington in Seattle to their virology uh, division. It costs, last time I checked, about $200. Uh, it is not a rapid response. You don't get it back within a day or two, uh, usually about a couple of weeks. And this is just how you can get it. But it is considered to be the gold standard, even though it's not FDA approved. Um, we've seen the HSV-1 ELISAs with the bioselect being a little insensitive for HSV-1. So they aren't perfect. But um, if you're concerned <clears throat> and people tell you I, there's no way I can have herpes and it was with one of these low titer tests, just repeat it with something else. Um, there has been no recent changes, uh, recommended changes in acyclovir, uh, valacyclovir, famcyclovir dosing. I won't persist on this, uh, give you a little bit of a chance to ask some questions here, but um, this is actually from the CDC's recommendations in 2015, which you can find online at cdc.gov uh, front slash STD, and you can find herpes easily within that. Uh, I do want to mention trichomonas vaginalis. Um, this sometimes is a little difficult to differentiate between bacterial vaginosis. If you're in a clinic and you don't have a way of testing for T. vaginalis, and you know some of this had been the Aptima uh, analyte, as I mentioned before, there is a newer test that actually looks really good. I don't know what the cost is, and I'm going to have discussions with the lab here for our women's health of using this BDMAX vaginal panel because it tests for BV and lots of things besides what we currently have, uh, which only really tries to look for the DNA of Gardnerella, um, Trichomonas, and Candida. And there's a lot more actors with BV than just Gardnerella. Um, so the BDMAX looks at a lot of these different bacteria associated with it, Trichomonas and Candida. Um, the treatment of choice for this historically has been, you could use metronidazole or tenidazole. Tenidazole is still a little bit more expensive, uh, but either one of those is two grams. Um, occasionally, resistance can develop if people uh, keep passing this back and forth. So it's really recommended that uh, in women who are getting treated for T. vaginalis, that their sexual partner or plural partners all get treated about the same time. Uh, for trichomonas so that it doesn't pass back and forth. Now, it's a little different in women with HIV because they don't do as well with a two gram dose. And here it's recommended to use 500 milligrams um, twice a day for seven days. That's actually the BV dosing for treating bacterial vaginosis. So if you're not sure and you don't have tests to, to tell you whether it's BV or trick, but you have a piece of pH paper and you can check vaginal secretions, not cervical, but vaginal secretions with this, um, if the pH is greater than 4.5, it's either going to be BV or trick. And if you're using this dose, you're going to be treating both. So that's just a little caveat that can help you if you don't have uh, somebody with funding and you do have some pH paper. Um, I'm going to leave you with this case um, just for a bit of discussion. So it's a 25-year-old woman who has a one-week history of a rash and um, hair loss uh, on her hair, on her head, sorry. Uh, she uses crack cocaine and recently entered a drug rehab program. She's HIV negative on admission to the program. She has no past history of STIs. She's highly allergic to penicillin. She gets hives. She develops uh, wheezing and strider, significant dyspnea that required her to go to the ED and get treated the last time she got penicillin about six months ago. Uh, on exam, you see this patchy hair loss, and she says she has this recent had a recent rash on her chest and trunk, and maybe even on her hands. You get an RPR; it's one to two fifty-six. The TPPA is positive. 
pregnancy test is negative. So what do you think is the most appropriate treatment for her? Is it benzathine penicillin? Give her benzathine penicillin and some steroids, ceftriaxone, doxycycline, or erythromycin? So you guys tell me, what do you think? What would you do if you were in clinic and this is your patient? So you know what she has. This can help. Doxycycline? Absolutely. You know, people get yeah. a little worried about cross-reaction between, you know, ceftriaxone and penicillin. It's probably okay, but in an anaphylactic-ish person, probably people aren't going to do that. She's not pregnant. This is what? What stage of syphilis is this? Is it primary, secondary, or early latent? Well, if, this is a board, no. if it's a board question, it's not early latent because she has manifestations. So it's either primary or secondary, right? I would say secondary. secondary. Yeah, it's secondary because she's got a rash. And sometimes people can develop secondary um, signs and symptoms while they still have a primary syphilitic uh, shanker. So she's got syphilitic, uh, a secondary syphilitic lesions. So that's fine. Hopefully, make sure you get an RPR about the time you're going to test her. If this RPR is old, get a new one uh, to give you a good starting point to watch her tighter, hopefully decrease. Um, there's one other test that's not on. Oh, I'm sorry, that is on here. That's very helpful as well. She is HIV negative because that may affect, you know, how well that she decreases. But that's the key. It's doxycycline. And I thank you for the time. Uh, that we spent today.